So as Liz joins us, let me welcome her and Dr. Evelyn Farkas from the McCain Institute. You can't see it on Zoom necessarily, but we're joined here in the room by extremism experts from across the country who are meeting with administration officials for candid conversations on what more can be done to counter the pernicious, pernicious threat of domestic extremism, which again, in video images that many of us watched just a few hours ago, in news of the, news of the arrest that happened just a few days ago, we are reminded about the urgency and the immediacy of this challenge. The McCain Institute and ADL have both led different but complementary efforts to counter these threats and protect communities from white supremacist and political extremist violence. In February 21, after the January 6th attack on the Capitol, ADL released our PROTECT plan, a seven point framework to help policymakers counter domestic extremism while protecting civil liberties. Since then, we've worked closely with federal, state and local officials, as well as non-governmental partners to implement these recommendations. And literally one year ago, this Wednesday, the Biden administration released its comprehensive plan, a national strategy to counter domestic extremism, terrorism, a first of its kind that actually shared many similarities with the ADL plan. And we're gonna talk about that today. The McCain Institute has been one of our closest partners in crafting counter extremism policies. They are leaders in many ways on these issues, including running a national network of terrorism prevention practitioners and producing a blueprint for countering white supremacy on which we were pleased to consult. With that, I'll turn it to Dr. Farkas, who leads the McCain Institute. She served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, as well as a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund and has spent her career working on these national, the intersection of these national security and homeland security issues, both inside and outside of government. Dr. Farkas. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. It's a really hard act to follow Ellen and Mark because they spoke so compellingly about the problem. Um, but I, I do think I need to give justice to my colleagues who have worked yeah. so hard. Um, the McCain Institute, we, we have worked to advance democracy and our international alliances to promote human rights and protect the vulnerable. And domestic terrorism, of course, threatens all of these values. And our, prevent, our preventing targeted violence team led by uh, Brett Steele, who's in the audience and you heard from earlier this morning, designs and deploys innovative programs across the United States and internationally to counter that threat. In, 2000, in 2021, as we all know, um, and this was of course before this year, but the US government recorded 73 domestic terrorism plots and attacks. And of course we witnessed the increasing frequency and lethality of these events strike fear across America. In June 2021, a year ago, the White House took a crucial step to raise awareness and marshal executive branch resources for the first time to address the growing threat of domestic terrorism with the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. We commend the White House for their leadership and the important advances they have made in the year since they released the strategy. Director Ray testified that the FBI, quote, more than doubled their domestic terrorism caseload from about 1,000 to 2,700 investigations and quote, surged personnel to match, more than doubling the number of people working that threat from a year before. Sadly, of course, it's never enough. And we have the reminder of the sense, reminder recently, the senseless slaughter of 10 Americans in Buffalo last month. And of course, the children and teachers in Uvalde even more recently. And so obviously we can and must do more to implement this national strategy and to meet the threat, the growing threat of, of domestic terrorism. Indeed, as Mark mentioned, just this morning in Idaho, police arrested 31 people affiliated with a white nationalist group who were about to execute a riot, probably a violent riot, at the Pride event at, uh, at Coeur d'Alene City Park in Idaho. The McCain Institute counters the threat of domestic terrorism through student innovation challenges, building capacity among local prevention providers and recommending policy options. Our Invent to Prevent program, Invent to, the number two, Prevent program empowers 50 high school and collegiate teams. They create interactive projects to prevent targeted violence and terrorism. 
our Prevention Practitioners Network shares promising practices and the latest research on preventing domestic terrorism with over 875 prevention practitioners. And the McCain Institute partnered with the Center on American Progress, the Center for American Progress rather, to produce the policy blueprint to end white supremacist violence in April, 2021. And while the, the White House national, Secure, national strategy adopted many of the recommend, recommendations in our policy blueprint, it stopped short of advocating for new legislation, which we may have a chance to talk about today. As we take stock of the progress made over the first year of the White House's national strategy and prioritize next steps, we urge policymakers to continue to prioritize public health approaches to prevention, such as those best exemplified by our Event to Prevent program and members of the Prevention Practitioners Network. We encourage lawmakers to look to our policy blueprint to end white supremacist violence and the ADL project plan to build upon the promise of the national, the national strategy and to pursue legislative support to step up efforts to counter domestic terrorism. And we are always very honored and happy to team with ADL and other organizations to increase, use our convening power and increase awareness and political support. A determined push for solutions to this problem must come from Americans of all political affiliations, putting aside differences to keep our communities safe. Preventative measures to domestic terrorism must be bipartisan in nature, centered around promoting inclusive communities and providing help and services to those most at risk. Our nation cannot continue to fear and mourn the senseless deaths caused by domestic terrorism. We can and must do more to implement and, and basically build upon the national strategy to counter domestic terrorism. So with that, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Liz Elizabeth Sherwood Randall, um, my former colleague from the Obama administration um, who has gone on to take ever greater responsibility. I will give you a quick synopsis of her resume. Um, she was the founding principal of the Harvard Stanford Preventative Defense Project and a senior research scholar at Harvard University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. In government, she served in very senior positions. Uh, starting in the Clinton administration, she had the job I used to hold <laughs> as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia. She distinguished herself in that job in the 1990s, some of you may remember, um, by essentially working to denuclearize three former Soviet states. And for that, she received the Defense Department's Medal for Distinguished Public Service and the Nunn Luger Trailblazer Award. Mm. And of course, she drew upon all that knowledge and experience when she later became under President Obama, special assistant to the president and White House coordinator for defense policy, countering weapons of mass destruction and arms control. And then finally, capping that phase of her career as deputy secretary of energy. Um, now, of course, we um, are honored to have her in her current role as Homeland Security Advisor to the president. And without further ado, I give the floor to you. Thank you. We have a long history, Evelyn and I. It's a joy to be here with you and with you, Jonathan. I want to start by thanking the Anti-Defamation League and the McCain Institute for convening this very important conversation about domestic violent extremism, which is a scourge on our land. And I want to recognize you, Jonathan, for your conviction and your energy and for your creativity in tackling these and many related challenges for your thought leadership in helping us to think bigger, more imaginatively about how we can go after these problems. And Evelyn, for your long partnership and friendship in working on many vital national security issues, including these today. Almost one year ago, as you have said, on the 23rd of June, uh, I discussed this for this national strategy for countering domestic terrorism in a conversation that was hosted by the University of Virginia. It was the first time I had the opportunity to speak publicly on this topic after we rolled out the national strategy. I chose that venue because it was particularly meaningful. It was, of course, in Charlottesville, the location of the deeply disturbing events just four years before and now five years ago this month. Those events were searing to me personally and uh, motivating to me to serve again if I had the chance to do so. 
I was taking in the news on that summer evening with my 17 year old son, William, who was about to go off to college. And we watched aghast as white supremacists, neo-Nazis, anti-government militias, anti-Semites and their supporters marched confidently down an American street chanting, Jews will not replace us and blood and soil. Even saying this to you today gives me the shivers to remember the moment. I remember being at a loss to explain to my child how this could happen in America. In this land to which our family had come in search of freedom from persecution, it was a really shocking moment. By the end of those two days in Charlottesville, three people were dead, including a young woman who was deliberately struck by a car and two state troopers who were providing support. A dozen more were injured. And here we are today, five years later, facing rising violence by individuals espousing racist, bigoted, and hateful ideologies. And as Mark Morial noted previously, who want to express their political views through violence, which is a big change for us in a country in which we have for decades and centuries had peaceful <clears throat> transitions of power. In just the first six months of this year, we've lived <clears throat> through Colleyville, when Jonathan and I came together, Buffalo, Laguna Woods, and Dallas. We're confronted with violent white supremacy and the distorted sickening concept of great replacement that motivated the violence in Charlottesville, that killed 51 worshipers in two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, that murdered six Asian women in Atlanta, and that left 10 dead in the Topps friendly supermarket in Buffalo, New York, just a few Saturdays ago. And we know that he was inspired, motivated to this violence by the Christchurch events. The pain of Buffalo remains fresh for all of us. And we continue to grieve this outrageous loss of innocent lives. Like the many who have lived through this unbearable pain before in Oak Creek, in Pittsburgh, in Charleston, in El Paso, where I recently visited, the lives of survivors and their communities are changed forever. These tragedies, one after another, share a common thread. They were perpetrated by individuals who hated the other who hated their Sikh or Jewish or Black or immigrant or Asian or Latino neighbors because of their racial, ethnic, or religious identities. And as a direct result of that belief, chose to murder them. As you know, the, uh, the notion that you should express your political views through violence almost impeded the hallowed peaceful transfer of power of presidential power last year. Uh, I was on the job at that time in the days preceding the transition. We had a team in the background that was working to ensure that that peaceful transition actually took place. And we have to credit the career professionals in law enforcement all across this national capital region community and beyond who worked to ensure that it actually happened. President Biden was sworn in just two weeks later after the January 6th assault on our Capitol, and he directed, as a result, the development of the first ever national strategy for countering domestic terrorism on his first day in office. He did so with clarity and conviction at every level of the federal government, at every level of the government led by the federal government we must do much more to confront the threat of domestic terrorism, which in its assault on our founding principles as a nation threatens the very survival of our democracy. That's what he said to us. This is about the survival of our democracy. So in two days, as you've noted, we will mark the first anniversary of the strategy and numerous colleagues across the administration will be speaking about its implementation, beginning with Deputy Attorney General Lisa Monaco's remarks following mine and my Deputy Josh Geltzer's participation in your subsequent panel. We're pushing hard to examine what has been achieved, recognizing that we have a long road ahead. And so I wanna emphasize that to you, this work has just begun and we have to be rigorous in evaluating what is working, what is not working, and how much more we have to do. 
because honestly, this work will never be done. As long as there are people who hate, we will continue to have to do this work and to improve our performance. Thinking back to what motivated my grandparents and great grandparents to emigrate to this land from places where they could not practice their faith in, without fear, I am determined that America should remain that beacon that led them here and to keep our light on in the darkness that is enveloping much of the world. So let's talk about what progress we've made and about where we need to keep doing the hard work. In a number of areas, we've made considerable progress toward the strategy's key objectives to understand the threat, to do everything we can to prevent it and to deter and disrupt it. The first pillar of the strategy focuses on that crucial piece of improving our understanding and information sharing about domestic terrorism, which we discovered was sorely lacking when we came into office. We are ensuring that the federal government is obtaining information on domestic terrorism comprehensively consistent with our constitutional protections, which is also something the president underscored as he set us on this path, that we have to be very careful in doing this work that we don't actually stimulate the very phenomena that we are trying to diminish. I'll highlight just a couple of efforts in this area. The FBI, the National Counterterrorism Center, and the Department of Homeland Security have produced three times more intelligence products on domestic terrorism this year than last which gives us greater insight into the threat itself. And there I will relate it to what um, uh, you noted, Evelyn, that there have been a number of, uh, more than double the number of actions taken by the FBI. Now, what that means is part of it is we're getting more information and part of it is that the threat is on the increase. So that is both good news and bad news, but we need to know what's happening in order to pursue it. These departments have also launched an information sharing app called ACT Knowledge, A-C-T Knowledge, to ensure both the public and law enforcement at federal, state, and local levels have relevant and up-to-date information to identify and prevent acts of domestic terrorism, to get the word out quickly and to ensure that people who need to have it have it on their mobile, mobile devices, which is where, as you know, most people get their information today. The Justice Department has improved its tracking of potential domestic terror terrorism related investigations and prosecutions and instituted new guidance and training for US attorney's offices to ensure they're reporting more detailed information on these cases to allow for better analysis, tracking and response planning. And in May, the Department of State launched the Counterterrorism Law Enforcement Forum with the Department of Justice in Berlin, Germany, bringing together relevant foreign partners to counter racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism globally. And I'll just note to you here, there isn't time for it today, but with most of my foreign counterparts uh, who are involved in this work in uh, sister democracies, they are facing similar challenges, uh, both in, in um, the perniciousness of the threat and the growth of the threat. Uh, and, and in particular in threats that are not only racially or ethnically motivated, but which are motivated by a desire to counter the very democratic experiment, their anti-government uh, threats that are quite severe, which go to the heart of our democracies. The second pillar of the strategy focuses on prevention. I've always believed that prevention, of course, is where we want to do our work because the more we can prevent, the less of a burden there will be uh, on in with respect to the response and the calamities that affect our communities and societies. We are improving the way we work with our state, local, non-governmental and academic colleagues, as well as importantly with the private sector to prevent individuals from reaching the point of committing acts of terrorism. To this end, the Department of Homeland Security has significantly increased its funding and expanded the scope of the grants it provides focused on localized prevention programming. Having allotted 77 million new dollars uh, last year through its Homeland Security Grants Program, DHS this year will anticipate a $51.5 million increase in the year ahead for domestic terrorism prevention at the local level. DHS is also building the first ever one-stop website for all federal resources related to targeted violence and domestic terrorism. This website will answer the request from many of our civil society colleagues and community leaders 
uh, for a clearinghouse that makes federal prevention resources, such as grants, training, research, and local social services, including mental health services, easier to find, navigate, access, and understand. This multi-agency endeavor is well underway, and we hope to launch this website later this summer, which will not be a moment too soon. Mm -hmm. Through the work of FBI, DHS, DOJ, and the National Counterterrorism Center, we're supporting our state and local law enforcement colleagues as they build trusted relationships on the ground with school administrators, mental health and social service providers, and faith-based leaders to better identify and manage threats before they escalate to violence. We have to work closely with our partners on the ground and in particular help families to have a safe place to go to report concerns about radicalization of a family member or for colleagues to feel that they have a safe place to go to report concerns about radicalization of a colleague so that it doesn't feel like you're ratting someone out but actually bringing them to the help they need before they do tremendous damage in a community. Drawing from the collective expertise of the entire federal enterprise, we will also work to gather best practices and share them with our state and local partners, convene leaders in this area to highlight what works and make funding and training available to facilitate more of these valiant efforts. Finally, and I just underscore this at the Department of Defense, where Secretary Austin found a significant concern in the force about potential radicalization to domestic terrorism, they are working with subject matter experts to shape and implement the recommendations of the Countering Extremism Working Group that Secretary Austin charged to address extremist activity in the department. The department is developing a comprehensive training and education plan that provides regular training on prohibitive, prohibitive extremist activity that will be available to DOD personnel and is updating policies to notify contractors of prohibited activities. Two. The third pillar of the strategy focuses on disrupting and deterring domestic terrorism activities. The Justice Department has established a dedicated terrorism unit to centralize our prosecutorial efforts and better leverage our available statutory authorities, which Deputy Attorney General Monaco will likely talk with you about further. We've also actively engaged with all levels of government to ensure law enforcement and prosecutors have the authorities they know what their authorities are and that they're fully utilizing available statutes to disrupt violent extremists before they commit violence. And I'll note, Evelyn, you raised the question of new federal statutory authority. Currently, much of that authority res resides in state and local communities. And so we have to be very sure they're aware of what they can do at the state and local level as the first line of defense. Finally, the fourth pillar of the strategy is a big long-term effort. It commits us to broader work to confront the long-term drivers, the long-term contributors to domestic terrorism. These involve enduring challenges to our nation from economic inequality to structural racism, to addressing the mental health crisis, to countering the proliferation of guns that enable mass acts of violence such as those we've seen just in the last few weeks. Last week, the president outlined a number of critical and common sense measures that Congress can enact to keep our country and our communities and our families and our children safe from gun violence, such as banning assault weapons and high capacity magazines, or at least raising the age to purchase them from 18 to 21. We propose strengthening background checks and repealing the immunity that protects gun manufacturers from liability and enacting safe storage laws and importantly red flag laws, something Ellen Alberting has worked so hard to advance, like those we applaud the Senate for reaching consensus on this weekend. Even without congressional action, we have taken aggressive steps, including reining in ghost guns, publishing model extreme risk pretension order protection order legislation as a resource for states and launching new law enforcement strike forces focused on significant firearms trafficking corridors. Despite this initial progress, we know, as I've said, that so much more will have to be done and that it will have to be done across time. 
And although I said at the outset that the president believes the federal government must lead and we must, we cannot succeed in combating domestic terrorism alone. Your partnership and guidance and the partnership and guidance of all those who are participating in this room and on the Zoom, and I understand we have more than a thousand participants, that guidance will be absolutely critical in shaping how we can protect our communities and prevent future acts of hate-fueled violence and build a civil society that returns to the kind of civil discourse that we have built our democracy upon. As an example of the synergy of purpose between the federal government and civil society, I do want to point out that ADL's PROTECT plan that you mentioned, Jonathan, highlights many of the same priorities as our national strategy. The PROTECT plan and the national strategy are closely aligned on matters such as prioritizing domestic terrorism, increasing available resources to government and partner organizations, preventing violent extremists, extremists from occupying positions of authority, targeting transnational actors who are seeking to incite violence and addressing, importantly, the proliferation of violent extremist content online. I'm so grateful for the efforts of the ADL and the McCain Institute and many others within and beyond this room. We need all of you, the constituencies and institutions that you represent and the active participation of citizens across the country to help us to meet defeat the domestic terrorism threat that we are all facing. We need our state and local law enforcement colleagues to continue to provide early warning to, from the ground. We need our tech sector colleagues to address the rampant proliferation of violent extremist content online. And we need our nonprofit and academic partners to continue to share their creativity and expertise with us as we tackle this challenge. A few of the tasks we've set for ourselves in the coming months include continuing to work alongside the technology companies through the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism that Nick Rasmussen leads and through the Christchurch Call to Action to improve mechanisms that companies employ to rapidly identify violent extremist content online and quickly act to remove it. This will help us to stop spread across the web through mechanisms like the Content Incident Protocol that the Global In Internet Forum to Counterterrorism activated in the immediate wake of the Buffalo shooting. And while it did not work perfectly, and we're meeting with Nick and his team on Wednesday to talk about what more we can do, it was a very important indicator of how significant this initial innovation is. President Biden met with New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern last month to affirm our commitment to the Christchurch call, and we're working closely with the New Zealand government ahead of the July Global Internet Forum to Counterterrorism Summit and the September Christchurch Christchurch Call Leaders Summit to aggressively analyze the role of tech companies in the Buffalo shooting and pursue improvements in tech accountability and crisis response. And we will continue our engagements with researchers, experts, and the on the ground implementers so we can lift up the ideas that work and to shine a light on best practices so that others can learn from them in real time. For example, we know there are cities that are ahead of the curve in their efforts to prevent, disrupt, and prosecute domestic terrorism, such as Oahu and Boston and San Antonio. And we want to raise the profile of that work so we can all learn from it. Despite the enormity of the challenge, we will not allow domestic terrorism and the hate and racism and radicalism that fuel it to destroy our way of being. It will take every one of us in this room and the circles we belong to, leveraging our resources, our relationships, our expertise, and our passionate conviction to defeat this challenge. And all this hard work is the work that democracy requires, that every day we do all that we can to uphold the purposes and principles and values and norms that undergird it. If we're complacent, democracy will not survive. If we fight for it, if we create the courage that Mark Morial mentioned, we can strengthen and we can improve it. After all, democracy isn't something that we create once. It is, as the president says, a way of being. And we want to be that way. Thank you each for all that you do and for inviting me to speak with you today. 
I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And I have to express my apologies. I have a pop-up event that prevents me from staying longer to engage in the questions and answers that we hoped for. Um, and I hope that after Lisa's speech, she will be able to engage. I, she had preceded me in this role in the administration before the prior administration, and she is here she comes walking in the room, I, I, superbly I positioned to be able to field any questions that you may have in my absence. So thank you again, and welcome Deputy Attorney General Monaco. Good afternoon. Good to see so many friends. Nice to see you. Pleasure. Nice, nice to see you. you. Well, you just got a great setup, I, I would did. say. <laughs> great. Liz noted that you preceded her in the Homeland Security Advisor role at the White House, and you follow her today as our <laughs> administration speaker. So thank you so much for coming, Deputy Attorney General Monica. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, thanks so much to uh, ADL and the McCain Institute for convening this, I think, really, really important discussion uh, and series of discussions. Um, uh, and thank you also for the incredible work that both institutions do every day to confront extremism, to protect civil rights, and frankly, to protect democracy, because uh, that's what those uh, two things in my mind are, are about. Um, I want to step back a little bit and talk about the department's role confronting these threats today. Um, I think we are at an inflection point uh, and, and at a point that I haven't seen in my lifetime focusing on these issues as, and it has been observed uh, over the course of many different roles. Um, from my time at the FBI uh, to my leadership of the National Security Division at the Department of Justice, to my time as Homeland Security and Counterterrorism Advisor in the White House, to today, uh, I've witnessed the broadening of the threat posed by terrorism. Um, but I come away from kind of reflecting on those different roles to where we are today, firmly convinced that we have got to maintain our focus on international terrorism while also addressing the growing, and I say emphasize growing, risk of domestic terrorism and the appalling rise in hate crimes that we have seen. That's why one year ago this week, the Attorney General announced the Biden administration's national strategy for countering domestic terrorism. The purpose, as you all I think well know, and I know uh, Liz laid out, um, the purpose of this first of its kind national strategy um, is to coordinate efforts across the government uh, against uh, and to confront the heightened threat of domestic terrorism. Uh, and I think the strategy um, really does a very good job uh, reflecting in the pillars that it lays out, reflecting the growing and heightened uh, risk uh, from domestic terrorism that we face today. Um, and to kind of step back, as I said I would, uh, and talk about the Justice Department's role here, I think the department was frankly a natural fit to help lead the effort on the strategy because combating extremist attacks and hate crimes and frankly protecting civil rights have been central to our mission since the department's founding nearly or more than now 150 years ago uh, when the department was founded uh, really in the wake of the civil war at the reconstruction era and founded with its founding purpose its fundamental purpose uh, to address hate uh, perpetrated by uh, white supremacists in the Ku Klux Klan um, and the efforts uh, to subvert uh, the um, civil rights uh, earned by Black Americans. That was the founding purpose. The Attorney General talks about this regularly. That was the animating purpose of the Department of Justice. And today, that work is frankly as urgent as it has ever been. At the Department, we didn't need uh, unfortunately, to be reminded 
of the threats posed by domestic violent extremism and the rise in hate crimes, but the anti-Semitic terrorist attack against Congregation Beth Israel in Colleyville, Texas earlier this year, and of course the racially motivated violent extremist attack in Buffalo just last month, and unfortunately so many other tragic incidents in the past year, these events have all brought uh, these threats into stark focus for communities across America. Now, as we all know, and as I think been laid out uh, very well and very starkly by our intelligence community, the most lethal domestic terrorism threat is posed by racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists and by militia violent extremists. Uh, and we continue to be in that elevated threat environment. On the one year anniversary of the attack on the Capitol and the attack on our democracy, the FBI director observed, and I quote, the problem of domestic terrorism has been metastasizing across the country, end quote. And our investigative efforts therefore must be, in my view, intelligence led and threat driven, and they are. The number of FBI investigations of suspected domestic violent extremists has more than doubled since the spring of 2020 as has the number of FBI personnel responding to that threat. Now, unfortunately, this increase in resources is all too needed uh, based on the threat that we face. As we have seen in the record increase in the number of hate crimes committed in the United States, rising to their highest level uh, in the last 12 years. And in response, the FBI has elevated hate crimes and criminal civil rights violations to its highest level national threat priority, increasing the resources for hate crimes prevention and investigations and making hate crimes a focus uh, in all of the FBI's 56 field offices. Now the threat environment and the resource demands mean that collaboration across the Department of Justice for sure, as well as across the interagency and across our state and local and private sector partners uh, is more important uh, than it has ever been. The department's national security and civil rights divisions now more than ever need to be very closely coordinated to leverage all of their expertise uh, to bring to bear in these investigations. And of course, the National Security Division has now also established a dedicated unit for domestic terrorism investigations. And unfortunately, we are exercising those muscles, those coordinating muscles between the National Security Division's focus on domestic terrorism and expertise in those investigations and the Civil Rights Division's longstanding expertise in uh, civil rights and hate crimes investigations and working in parallel with our state and local partners on those. And we are bringing that expertise and that coordination uh, to bear most recently and most unfortunately in the horrible attack that occurred in Buffalo uh, just last month. Even before though the national strategy was launched last year, the department was stepping up its efforts. In the first weeks of the new administration, my office convened the Domestic Terrorism Executive Committee. This was a body that was originally created in the aftermath of the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. Somewhat ironically, it was set to meet on September 11th of uh, 2001. Uh, and it did not meet on that day for obvious reasons. Uh, but it has needed to be revitalized and has uh, been so in this administration. And this, what we call the DTEC, uh, serves, I think, an important interagency function in coordinating, uh, providing a coordinating mechanism across domestic terrorism issues. We've also, though, changed the way our prosecutors and investigators report and track investigations with a domestic terrorism nexus. Now, we did this precisely to kind of learn the lessons that we gained uh, in the wake of 9-11 in the time since um, uh, the 9-11 attacks. And that is, we need to have a national picture of the threat and a national picture of investigations and prosecutions occurring across the country. So what we did at the beginning of this administration is 
um, my office issued a directive to all the U.S. attorney's offices to say, when you have an investigation in your area of operations that has a domestic terrorism nexus, you need to report that in to the Department of Justice. We back here need to have a national picture of what those investigations look like. So we're not looking at these things in silence, just as we did, as everyone knows, post 9-11, so that we could connect the dots in international terrorism investigations, which has now become, for those of us in the national security world, a kind of article of faith, we have to do the same thing when it comes to domestic terrorism investigations. And so we've done that and we've learned some really interesting things about the um, investigations that the US Attorney's Office see, compared that with our state and local partners and with what the FBI is doing. So we have a data-driven approach and we have a much fuller national picture, both of the threat and of our investigative activity uh, to address it. I think a very important lesson learned from our experience post 9-11 um, that we have brought to bear in the domestic uh, terrorism context. Uh, these efforts, I think, advance one of the strategies, frankly, primary goals, which is, of course, information sharing across and outside the federal government. Now, of course, the FBI, as you all know, is on the front lines of these efforts, including through the nearly 200 joint terrorism task forces across the country and through the work of its domestic terrorism and hate crimes fusion cell trying to ensure seamless information sharing across the organization. And we are doing the same thing in our US attorney's offices. We're bringing together expertise to track domestic terrorism and uh, hate-fueled violence. Each US attorney's office, of course, has an anti-terrorism advisory council, as well as a civil rights coordinator. And we're enhancing domestic terrorism training across the US attorney's offices. So our prosecutors are better equipped uh, to confront these investigations. And this is, I think, a really important point of focus for us when it comes to both domestic violent extremist activity as well as hate crimes. What we've recognized over time is that failing to acknowledge the existence of hate crimes can make victims and communities feel devalued by and disconnected from their government, from law enforcement that serves them, uh, from society at large. And so we are trying to increase the visibility of our efforts to combat hate and domestic terrorism with the goal, quite obviously, of deterring these crimes, communicating our intolerance for them and ensuring that there's accountability for crimes that frankly, not only affect and harm the individual um, who the violence is perpetrated against, but against an entire community that that uh, individual is a member of. Toward that end, the FBI has been hosting regional conferences regarding civil rights, federal civil rights and hate crimes laws with the goal of encouraging and educating about reporting and hopefully to build trust with the communities that we serve. We've also launched an FBI-led anti, national anti-hate crimes campaign involving all of the uh, 56 FBI field offices. And we've been adding and frankly enhancing a number of key positions uh, on these issues. The Attorney General recently designated a new anti-hate crimes resources coordinator and uh, importantly, I think, particularly in the hate crime space, a language access coordinator to help ensure individuals have the resources they need. And for the first time now, the Civil Rights Division has a individual who is focused on expediting review of hate crimes matters. And by that, I mean not only those matters that rise to the level of a federal uh, civil rights violation or hate crime, but a hate crime incident uh, that we need to monitor and track, again, to make those linkages if a particular incident doesn't rise to the level of federal civil rights violation, we still wanna be seeing what that data tells us about um, particular hate incidents. Finally, before I close and take some questions, I wanna say that I don't think we can come together on this topic without acknowledging and condemning the appalling rise in violence that we've seen from a range of ideologies directed at frankly, at public officials, including members of the Supreme Court. We don't tolerate this criminal behavior, and we've taken steps to address it, including by having members of the U.S. Marshals Service 
24 seven uh, protecting members of the court and providing assistance to the marshal of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court police. My message has been consistently to the department, including all of the 94 US attorney's offices around the country, too many of which quite frankly, have or will respond to a critical incident is that we have got to do our work as one department, a department that is deeply committed to disrupting and confronting terror and hate with the National Security Division using its expertise on domestic terrorism uh, and working hand in glove with the Civil Rights Division um, uh, and its expertise in civil rights and hate crimes cases uh, and has been all too often, I think in the recent months, uh, having to focus on bias motivated extremism uh, and hate crimes when it rears its head. Uh, the men and women of the Department of Justice are working every day to combat hate and extremism, not only because it's our job, but because we believe very fundamentally that no one in this country should fear violence, should fear threats of violence because of who they are. We believe it is our collective responsibility to do all we can to combat hate in all its forms. So I wanna thank you for having me uh, as part of this discussion, but most importantly, I wanna thank you for your collective leadership on protecting uh, all Americans from hate and from domestic violent extremism. Uh, and thanks for having me. So um, thank you so much, Deputy Attorney General Monica, for being Please, with us. Lisa, otherwise <laughs> we'll be here all day. It's, too long a, title. it's a long title, yeah. Um, no, but it's, it's wonderful to have you here given your depth and breadth of experience on this issue set. One of the questions um, I, I did raise in my remarks with um, Liz was whether the White House, so I'll reframe it and say whether the Department of Justice mm -hmm. um, is contemplating, proposing to the White House any additional legislation at the federal level. She talked about the need for state and local governments to take the lead, mm -hmm. but I think we'd be interested in knowing whether there's anything that you think could be done and should be done at the federal level legislatively. Well, look, we've been greatly aided by the Jabbar Hire Act and a number, frankly, a number of the steps that I outlined that we have taken on the hate crimes front um, in the coordinator role and the expediter that we now have in the Civil Rights Division have all been spawned by great, um, great ideas and helped by legislation that has, uh, has passed in the last 18 months on, on that front. Uh, when it comes to uh, domestic terrorism um, legislation, you know, what I and the Attorney General have consistently said on this front is that frankly, we wouldn't be doing our jobs if we weren't always open to the idea that if there's a gap in the law, then we need to know how to address it uh, and we need to be open to addressing it. Thus far, uh, we have not seen conduct that we can't address using the authorities that we have, um, but obviously we wouldn't be doing our job if we weren't open to identifying and filling gaps if they do arise and we're open to those with subject matter expertise uh, to raise that. But thus far, uh, we haven't seen that. I will also say um, we should always be very clear whenever we are taking steps uh, on the legislative front uh, to be concerned about and careful in our efforts um, to make sure that we don't court unintended consequences uh, from any uh, legislative efforts. And we're, uh, we're all too familiar uh, with, uh, you know, with those concerns. And so we would always be very sensitive and attentive to not um, prompting unintended consequences with any, uh, with any proposal. Thank you for that. So I know we have a question in the room and I think um, hopefully you have a mic. <laughs> so um, uh, Ellen Alberding, she's the president of the Joyce Foundation is um, the moving force behind this event. Um, longtime supporter of ABL and an advocate for the prevention of domestic terrorism. So without further ado, I hand it to you. Thank you. And thank you so much for both of your remarks. So helpful to us. We're, we're just beginning to get 
involved and trying to figure out the role of philanthropy in this complex issue. And of course, most of what we've heard today is about the government's role. And so, you know, appropriately, modestly, we understand that our resources are to some extent, you know, the crumbs off the table. On the other hand, there are things that philanthropy can do that that government can't for a bunch of um, for a bunch of reasons. Um, a young woman from uh, the Chicago Urban League, Yvette Badu Namako, spoke earlier, and she I, she did a nice job of talking about how important it is to have people on the ground amplifying or um, um, supporting ideas that are also coming from government and other places. Um, and I'm my question for you is, what do you think is a useful role for philanthropy to play. We're, we're funding the ADL and Urban League partnership. You know, we're excited to do that. But, you know, if you were sitting in the shoes of people running philanthropies, what would you direct us to do? So what I would say in this first, I would say, uh, don't sell yourself short because <laughs> the non-governmental actors in this space have frankly been way ahead of the curve. I've, Jonathan and I have had this discussion. Uh, I talk about a data-driven uh, approach. Um, frankly, the best data in this space for a long time has been ADL's data, right? Uh, and the reporting that it does, the, um, the scholarship, the research, the attention, the advocacy, um, frankly, the attention uh, has been uh, from ADL uh, and peer institutions. So um, I think it is incredibly important, the work that uh, philanthropy does to support um, uh, actions like ADL has led in this space. Uh, and frankly, being many times you can operate a lot more nimbly um, as I will not so humbly say <laughs> than those of us in the government. I think Evelyn would, would uh, agree with me having uh, served for a long time um, uh, in government roles. Uh, so being able to be kind of, I hate to use the sports metaphor, but skate to where the puck is going. <laughs> and folks like the ADL and the McCain Institute can be pointing that way uh, and having, having philanthropy kind of support and be the kind of guiding light there, I think is incredibly important. So regrettably, we have, uh, we don't have, we're a little bit over time already, but I really just, I think everyone heard here how lucky we are to have a public servant like Lisa Deputy in the Deputy Attorney General role. Your experience at the White House on the security side, Homeland Security side, combined with your station now, literally make you the perfect person to be driving this across the federal government. And we're just, all of us are grateful for your service. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Very much.